Welcome, everyone. We are going to begin the webinar on OSHA's Body Shop Enforcement and Safety Program. I'm Melissa Joles with RDA Impact. Brandon Thomas, Chief Operating Officer for GMG EnviroSafe, is your presenter for this webinar. The presentation will take approximately 30 minutes, and we are recording it and we'll post it on our YouTube channel. If you have questions during the webinar, you can type them in the chat box at the bottom right of your screen, and Brandon will answer them at the end of the presentation. Now I'll turn it over to Brandon. Thank you, Melissa. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join me today. I hope you and your families are all safe and doing well. For those of you that may not know me or have not participated in one of the webinars before, I think it's important for you to know just a little bit about my background, which is from the collision repair industry. Uh, I was the president of Collision Revision, which was a 30 shop MSO in Chicago prior to joining GMG EnviroSafe. And I've been the president of GMG now for the past eight years. So everything that we're gonna to discuss today is from the perspective of making employee safety and compliance as simple as possible for shops, from the perspective of a former shop operator, not a former industrial hygienist or OSHA inspector. GMG EnviroSafe has been providing EPA, OSHA, and DOT compliance, as well as employee health and safety programs and risk management strategies to the collision repair industry for over 30 years. We work with over 3,000 shops today and do that throughout the entire country. Here's our agenda. You can see we've got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, we'll start first with a review of shop hazards injury data for the collision repair industry and their associated costs. Uh, then we'll go to work on how to control these hazards at your shop, including reviewing best practices for tooling, equipment, and personal protective equipment. Finally, uh, since the last webinar that we did was COVID-19 related back in April, uh, we've gotten a few questions uh, from people that went through that webinar that Melissa has asked me to touch on. Uh, so we'll do a quick COVID-19 update at the end of the presentation before opening it up for Q&A. Okay, jumping right into it. A hazard is the potential for harm in a shop. It can be a condition of an area or a specific action uh, that an employee takes that can result in an injury or an illness. Uh, hazards can be negligible and unlikely to result in a major injury, or it can all the way be catastrophic, such as a fatality, a fire, or an explosion. When we talk about all workplaces, all industries, hazards get grouped into six categories. Biological hazards would be viruses, bacteria, insects, animals. You'd be amazed at how many work comp claims we see in shops from spider and snake bites, especially in markets like Texas. Chemical hazards are fairly straightforward. Uh, this is the wheel acid that could burn your eyes or the clear coat that can give you skin irritation or lacquer thinner that could catch on fire. A physical hazard would be something that can harm an employee without necessarily touching them, such as noise, radiation, or pressure. This would be the air chisel damaging someone's ears while they are using it because they're not wearing earplugs. Safety hazards are unsafe working conditions, such as the gas cylinders not being chained to the wall or your solvent-based paint waste not being grounded properly. An ergonomic hazard is the result of how someone physically does the work, such as bending or twisting at their waist or even a CSR or an estimator sitting at their desk improperly for an extended period of time. Finally, psychosocial hazards are those that have an adverse effect on mental health, such as sexual harassment, stress, or workplace violence. Most shop operators do not realize the extent of the hazards at their workplace, but when we look at the industry level data of work comp claims across the entire country, we see very quickly how long this list can become. Some of the obvious hazards are respiratory disorders from paint and solvent vapors or isocyanate exposure in the hardeners. We also have particulates, objects, and chemical splashes that can get into the eyes, especially if we're disassembling a vehicle or we're grinding. Repetitive stress and carpal tunnel in the hands and wrists, strains from awkward lifting, 
heavy lifting or twisting with the lower back. Lacerations and punctures are pretty common in the shop, especially when we're talking about handling sharp metal, sharp edges, different types of tools. Crushing itself, it isn't one that most shop managers would think of, but we actually do see this fairly frequently, especially when we talk about a vehicle rolling over someone's foot or a door shutting on someone's finger or hand, uh, or when it's really disastrous, even as bad as a vehicle falling onto an individual from a floor jack failing or a lift failing. Burns and heat stress from welding or working outdoors in hot climates, but also fires from flammable liquids, electric shock from hybrid vehicle work, and tools like battery chargers that could malfunction or be used in a, uh, a poor area like outside in the rain. We've actually had a few fatalities over the last 15 years in our industry from battery chargers malfunctioning. And then finally, we have injuries from walking surfaces, whether they're uneven or damaged or tripping hazards from the air hoses and tools or just plain slippery floors from oil, dust, or ice in the parking lots in the winter. At GMG, we have the benefit of access to work comp data from all of our customers. We recently completed a study of thousands of shops over a multi-year period with several thousand claims. And when we take those findings and we extrapolate them to the entire industry, we can reasonably estimate between 15 and 20,000 injuries per year. Now this includes the negligible injuries that don't even require first aid. If we wanted to look at more serious injuries specifically, we could turn to the data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics that shows right around 5,000 recordable injuries reported to OSHA annually from our industry. A recordable injury would be something that requires medical first aid or medical treatment beyond first aid, missed work days, loss of consciousness, or a fatality. We took all of the claims from our collision shop customers and we broke them down to the most common inju in injuries for our industry. We found that strains and lacerations to be the largest causes of injuries with over 50% combined. And when you talk to managers and owners of shops, that's typically the ones that they mention. Contusions are very common as well. That would be if somebody got struck by something or um, they bumped their elbow into a parts cart or a vehicle while they were working on something. A lot of slips and trips can end up in contusions. Um, if they hit their knee on the way down, but they can also go into strains depending on how bad the injury is. Over and over with our customers, we see foreign body claims and we see uh, mandatory safety glass policies making huge impacts on these injuries. But across the uh, data that we saw, they were about 11% of all injuries in our industry. And then we see a lot less frequency for the other categories that are on the screen right now. But remember, this is relative to total injuries. Don't be fooled by the low percentages into being complacent or thinking that these aren't potential issues at your shop. If we're dealing with 15, 20,000 injuries per year, this means that the industry has 200 to 300 respiratory disorders every single year. Although the percentage isn't really high in terms of a total number, the human cost, and the financial cost for this type of injury is significant compared to maybe a minor laceration on the finger. Next, we broke the data down into body part. Now, this is data for any injury type. So shoulder injuries at 6% and arms at 7% would indicate strains, but it would also include lacerations on the forearm or contusions on the elbow. Hands and wrists are significant at 25%, and that's a lot of mashed fingers from tools or cuts from razor blades or even as far as carpal tunnel on the wrists from repetitive stress. Leg and knee is at 12%. Usually this is chronic strain from working low to the ground or kneeling. Foot injuries is uh, 8%. That's a lot of dropped parts or cars rolling over toes. Uh, consistent with what we saw with the foreign object claims, eye injuries are around 12% for the entire industry. Uh, flash burn from welding would also be included in this body part. The face includes the head and the neck, so concussions, bumps, or getting hit in the mouth by a flying object would be in the 7%. And then finally, 
as expected, the back is a huge injury risk for our shop employees with 18% of total injuries in the industry. Finally, we took this same data and we look at what these injuries cost an average shop. Now, you may be lucky and you only have a small injury that doesn't require any first aid. You may also not be so lucky and you have a major back injury that requires extensive physical therapy, rehabilitation, and surgery. However, overall, we can analyze all of these claims and calculate what each injury type typically costs on average. Now, this is measured as a direct cost, and a direct cost for an injury would include insurance deductibles, medical payments, disability payments, legal expenses, and claim administration. Essentially, this is what you write a check for. Since 2014, the direct cost of a single injury for our industry is $10,849. And the important thing to note is that this is over and above any insurance premiums that are also paid, which may explain why work comp premiums are so high for businesses in our industry, even though you may only have a few injuries per year. When we take the $10,849 cost and we compare it to total injuries across the collision repair industry, we see a range of $159 million to $213 million spent on direct injury costs each year. The far higher number and the one that shop owners and managers don't see or they don't necessarily identify is the indirect cost from an injury. These are items that you do not write a check for and there is no line item on the P&L, but they definitely cost the shop money. OSHA and various safety associations across the country have studied the impact of indirect costs and calculated them to be between three and 10 times higher than the direct costs. When you think of your shop, what would it cost you if your most productive and your highest quality body technician was out on injury leave for just a few weeks? When you measure the drop in productivity on the cars that couldn't be repaired as efficiently or potential quality control issues that result in a vehicle coming back, or having to pay overtime for someone else to jump in to complete those vehicles. It adds up really, really quickly. Beyond the loss in productivity, we see reduced morale and absenteeism when injuries occur at a shop. There is a cost for managers to handle the administration for investigating the accident and reporting it to the insurance company. If you have to replace the employee, there are significant costs from recruiting, hiring, and training a new person, even if that person's only going to be there temporarily. If someone gets hurt using equipment, you might have to repair or replace that damaged equipment or the tools or the vehicles that were involved with the injury. For instance, if a vehicle fell off of a jack or a lift. Also, we have emergency supplies from the first aid kit that were consumed to respond to the injury. And that's over and above any potential OSHA citations and fines from the injury. Now, if we just assume on the conservative side and say three times the cost of direct injuries, a shop has over $30,000 for indirect costs from a single injury, or between $480 million and $639 million in annual costs for the entire industry. Studies have shown that investing in injury prevention has a huge impact on the profitability of the business, and that for every $1 invested in injury prevention, the business would see a return of between $2 and $6. A survey of CFOs from Fortune 500 companies reported that increased productivity was the biggest benefit when introducing an injury prevention program. We have seen similar numbers with our own customers when we start working with them. We just recently completed a case study of a multi-site operator that started working with us that had an injury rate of 1.02 per location and over $12,000 in direct costs per injury. After implementing the injury prevention program, including technician training, quarterly on-site assessments, and a monthly safety meeting, we saw a huge drop in injury rate per location, and the injuries that they did have were not nearly as expensive or as severe. This particular client saw over a 400% return on their direct costs alone, 
which is within the ranges of two and six from the OSHA studies. Even further, this does not count the benefit of reduced indirect costs, especially more productivity. So how do we implement an injury prevention program at your shop? Well, first, we would need to understand that there is a hierarchy of controls on how to prevent injuries in the first place. People that are in the safety and health industry depict this as an inverted pyramid, and it progresses from the most effective control method at the top to the least effective at the bottom. The first is elimination, where you remove the hazard from your shop altogether. One level down is substitution, where we replace the hazard with something that is less hazardous or safer to use. Then there's engineering, where we have the same hazard, but we isolate employees from them so that they aren't exposed to that hazard. Then we've got administrative controls where we retrain or we recommunicate how to work with the hazard so employees can be better educated on how to work safely. And finally, we use personal protective equipment to protect the employee from the hazard. To give you a real world example of the hierarchy of controls, a shop could evaluate the risks of a painter manually cleaning a spray gun with a cleaning solvent and consider a variety of options on how to protect their employee. The first option would be elimination, where they could purchase and set up a fully enclosed gun washer where all of the gun washing activity occurs in that particular cabinet. Substitution could also work, where we swap out the cleaning product for something that is water-based and not as hazardous to the individual. An engineering control would be to exhaust the vapors away from the painter so they're not exposed to those heavy solvents or materials. And an administrative control would be to train the painter on how to manually clean their spray gun without atomizing any material. And finally, personal protective equipment, we would provide safety glasses, gloves, and a respirator to wear when cleaning the spray gun. Now that we know how to control the hazards, we need to identify them in the shop itself. And we do this with a method known as a job hazard analysis, or JHA. This is a technique that focuses on the specific tasks performed by your employees to identify hazards before they occur. To be effective, the JHA will include the employee, the task that they are performing, the tools that they use to perform it, and where in the facility they are performing it. The different control options within the hierarchy of controls are then evaluated for their effectiveness in controlling the identify hazards for the job tasks. Remember, we want to involve your employees in the JHA. The body technicians or the painters are going to be able to provide a much more comprehensive review of the different ways things can go wrong and if controls are practical to implement. While working through a JHA, it's going to feel a lot like detective work where you ask a lot of questions to try to discover information. What can go wrong? What happens if it goes wrong? What are the consequences? How could it go wrong? What are some of the other contributing factors? How likely is it that this is going to happen? Where in the facility can it occur? An example of these types of questions would be if we were looking at the process of cleaning body side moldings. So the where or the environment would be in the body department while cleaning a body side molding. The tool or the contributing factor or the trigger would be the razor blade or the box cutter slips. And then the consequences, the result of that hazard would be it cuts the technician's hand. Now I have an example that I will pull over onto the screen of our job hazard analysis form that shops can use. And if you would like a copy of this, you can email me after the presentation and we'll get it over to you uh, without any costs or restrictions. Essentially, you review the work area, such as the body department, and then you identify the task that is being completed. For example, sanding with a DA. 
And then you would review what the employee is exposed to for each body part. Now, for some of these, there may not be any hazards from the procedure of DA sanding for that particular body part. For others, there may be more than one hazard that applies to that body part when we are doing sanding with the DA. So for this example, I would check airborne dust and flying particles from sanding in the eyes and face section, and then I would control that hazard with safety glasses. If I could eliminate the hazard altogether without using personal protective equipment, such as implementing a vacuum sander, I could mark that as well. And then what you'd want to do is you'd want to complete one of these for each job or task for each department to complete a comprehensive JHA. While compiling the JHA, you'll likely find opportunities to implement different tooling and equipment to eliminate or mitigate hazards. This would be the substitution control on the hierarchy of controls, which is very high in the uh, inverted pyramid. Some popular examples that I've pulled from customers are on the screen. So in the upper left-hand corner, we have a specific tool for cleaning body side moldings that is easier to handle and less likely to slip than a box cutter or a razor blade. You also could switch out to more ergonomically designed hand tools like in the lower left that puts the tension in the tool instead of the person's wrist to reduce the risk of repetitive stress injuries. Speed racks or other types of lifting devices to elevate the vehicle while working can be installed to reduce the bending at the waist or the awkward positions for a body technician. If this is too expensive for the shop, then a lower cost alternative would be kneeling, sitting creepers for body technicians. Finally, dust extractors or vacuum sanders to eliminate the dust exposure are a great safety addition. And go jacks for that make moving a vehicle in the shop easier and safer when there is damage to the wheels. If the hazards cannot be controlled through tooling and equipment, then the JHA will list the minimum requirements for personal protective equipment by body part while performing the task. For most shops, this is going to have minimum requirements for eye protection, such as are outlined on the screen. So we would see safety glasses with side wraps when we're performing tasks such as disassembly, sanding, mixing, buffing, and detailing to control flying particles, uh, chemical splashes, that sort of thing. When we're grinding, we would use a face mask over the top of safety glasses to protect the face and mouth uh, from any type of flying metal that could come off of uh, whatever is being grinded or the grinding disc itself. Uh, a welding helmet to protect, protect from ultraviolet radiation or flash burn to the eyes when we're welding. And a full face mask or respirator uh, for when we're spraying. One of the key things to note here is uh, wearing safety glasses and a half face respirator for someone that is spraying in the paint booth. It does not create a seal around their eyes. And when we talk about isocyanate exposure that could be present in your activators and hardeners in your clear coat process, um, there is the presence of isocyanates that uh, can be attracted to the eyes and cause a lot of health issues. So very important that painters are not attempting to use safety glasses that do not create that seal. Uh, and they're using a form of personal protective equipment um, that seals their eyes away from that type of exposure. In terms of hand protection, uh, we would see uh, nitrile gloves, uh, also latex for detail department, um, or neoprene if there's a latex allergy or there's a concern from a nitrile from a personal individual health standpoint. But this is going to be for chemical handling and spraying. We would have some type of metal mesh or leather uh, that will provide cut resistance when we are doing disassembly of vehicles. Heat resistant gloves for our welding or uh, using a torch cart tasks for cutting. And if we are working with high voltage batteries, hybrid vehicles, if we are doing that type of work in the facility itself and not subletting that out, uh, the technicians would need to have uh, Lyman gloves that are class O 
for high voltage. And these, if you have them in your facility, they have to be tested every six months to ensure that there are no micro punctures uh, to where someone could be electrocuted. Uh, and you have to keep a log for that. So very, very important that uh, you're keeping up with the record keeping on those gloves. Respiratory protection in terms of what we see as minimum personal protective equipment requirements. Uh, a half face respirator with a P100 type cartridge um, or filter rather. Uh, if we're mixing body filler, if we're sanding, if we're buffing. Uh, a welding respirator uh, for our welding tasks. You can use the um, respirator on the left for welding as well. However, most technicians, their welding helmet um, is a little bit more narrow to their face. And so the filters that are on the side valves. Uh, the helmet might not be able to fit over it. So the full face style is typically uh, an easier fit. Uh, and then when we're spraying, again, a full face respirator or a papper or a fresh air system uh, that uh, will be used in the paint booth uh, with some type of organic vapor protection above and beyond uh, any particulates. And those are the types of cartridges that you see there. Um, Beyond eye, hand, and respiratory protection, your shop will also likely need skin protection, such as spray suits, uh, and hearing protection, such as earplugs or muffs, when technicians are intermittently using air chisels or air hammers. Finally, the JHA will consider when things go wrong, uh, essentially responding to emergencies. So if you have certain chemicals that are irritating or corrosive to the eyes, you'll need eyewash stations, even though you may have safety glasses on the PPE list. Keep in mind that there are requirements for emergency equipment as well. For instance, eyewash stations must be able to provide 15 minutes of flush time. So the small handheld bottles are not going to meet the OSHA requirements. A first aid kit will need to have a minimum amount of supplies based on the work environment. Now this is normally for a body shop, the ANSI Z308.1 2015 Class A standard, which seems like a lot to remember, but you can actually just look up this standard and order the materials for this kit directly from a supplier or your first aid vendor. Finally, if we were to have a major spill or release, secondary containment for waste drums. The important thing here is that the containment needs to be at least equal to the largest drum on the pallet. So if you have two 55 gallon drums of liquid paint waste, for most shops that would be one for solvent and one for water paint or water-based paint like your base coats, you would need at least 55 gallons of containment, not 110 gallons. You do not need to add the drums together. It is equal to or larger than the largest drum on the pallet. So the two drum pallet is quite tall, and you can see it on the screen, to reach 55 gallons at a minimum of capacity. And that one is on the left. The four drum is lower to the ground, about 11 inches, to get to 55 gallons of capacity, but it does take up more floor space. So if you have a two drum, 11 inch high containment, which we do see in shops a lot, that's really only about 30 gallons of containment. And the largest drum that sits on those containment pallets should be 30 gallons, not 55. Now, as someone that once had to implement a brand new safety program at a 30 shop organization, I know how intimidating this all sounds. But it's important to think of creating a safety culture as a journey, not a destination. You don't plateau with safety in your organization. And open communication and positive reinforcement from leadership is critical. If you delegate this responsibility to your CSR or an estimator, um, that just tells your shop employees that this isn't important to you. And if it isn't important to you, whether you're the manager or the owner of the shop, it's not going to be important to your technicians or your painters. There are a few key steps to help you create a safety culture that we work to implement at the shops. First, 
verbally acknowledge the behaviors that you want to see. If someone is doing the right thing, vocalize it, tell them. While you walk through the shop to address vehicles and process, look for these opportunities to praise. Don't save this for a performance review. Don't write it in a file to tell them later. Address it immediately. The impact and the influence of praise and positive reinforcement diminishes with time. Telling someone at the next safety meeting a month from now or on their performance review a year from now that they did something good doesn't make as much of an impact. It's telling them right then and there while they're doing it. Be specific on what they're doing. Don't just say good job. For example, you would want to say, hey, great job wearing the face shield over your safety glasses while grinding. That is exactly what we want to see. Thank you. Now, on the other side, we have to be very careful with giving someone a tangible reward for positive behavior, for safe actions. Because if you do not provide the reward every single time they do it, it loses value very, very quickly. If you need to criticize someone for an undesired behavior, don't include it with the praise. This is a separate conversation. And finally, what I think some shops take for granted, but it's very, very important, respect the knowledge that your employees have. Encourage them to share their expertise. As a company that's been doing this for 30 years, some of the best suggestions we've gotten for tooling, equipment, procedures, general safety, chemicals has come from the body technicians and the painters that do this every day for a living to repair vehicles. And when it's their idea that gets implemented, they now have ownership over it and will be another safety advocate for you to help drive the culture at your shop. Okay, I am now going to go in 180 degrees and completely change the conversation. Um, bear with me as we get into COVID-19. We will have an opportunity to answer your questions at the end. Um, but I was asked to provide an update and some clarification on a couple of key things that have developed within our industry uh, to the group today. The first is that uh, when we're talking about surface cleaners, we've seen a lot of shops around the industry uh, that are attempting to create peace of mind with their customers. Uh, trying to uh, ensure that their customers know that their business is a safe place to do business. And when they're communicating, they're using certain language to describe the procedures and the protocols that they have implemented to ensure their safety. And it is important that you understand that words are not interchangeable. And when we're talking about surface cleaning of vehicles or surfaces themselves, they mean different things. Clean means to remove dirt and debris from a surface. Sanitize means to reduce the population of bacteria by significant numbers, but it does not destroy or eliminate all bacteria and it does nothing for viruses. Disinfect means to destroy bacteria, fungi, and viruses. So, these types of terms are regulated by the EPA because they are registered as pesticides, because they kill or destroy or deactivate living things. If a shop is using a chemical that sanitizes to clean surfaces, such as the front counter at their lobby, or the steering wheel, or the high-touch surfaces in a vehicle, they are doing nothing to prevent COVID-19 exposure. Now, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of chemicals that are out there. And I have seen many chemical manufacturers and distributors advertising to shops to get them to use their products for vehicle preparation. The best way to evaluate whether or not that chemical is a legitimate surface cleaner for COVID-19 or preventing COVID-19 and destroying the SARS-CoV-2 virus you would use the EPA's N list. You go to Google, you put in EPA's N list, you go to their website, there is a search where you can put in the EPA ID number from that chemical, or you can also search by name. If it is listed, it'll tell you how long that chemical needs to be on a surface. 
to properly disinfect. That's called contact time. It might be between five and 20 minutes. If it is not on that list, and I have seen a lot of our shop customers that have come to us and given us these chemicals that are not on this list, it is doing nothing for COVID-19 and would not be something you would want to tell your customers you are using to provide to make sure that they have peace of mind as it relates to exposure to the virus. Taking it one step further, we need to be wary of the claims that we make to customers. I have seen ads and Facebook videos from shops advertising ozone machines and foggers, and the shop claims that they disinfect the vehicle or that they kill 99.9% .9 of microbes, fungi, and viruses. This is very, very misleading. There is no way for a shop to substantiate, to validate, or to prove this claim that you are disinfecting the entire vehicle. We have porous surfaces like the fabrics. We have non-porous surfaces like the vehicle dash. We have a lot of different surface types and substrates, plastics, leathers, metal, that sort of thing. Um, to use a chemical, let's just call it Clorox bleach for uh, ease of example, that it self-advertises it kills 99.9% .9 of microbes and viruses. And to use it outside of the manufacturer's instructions, which is going to be 10 to 15 minutes of contact time on a surface and then wiping it away, and there's going to be restrictions on the type of surfaces that you can use it on, to use it differently than the chemical manufacturer tells you to use it by plugging it into a fogger or an ozone machine is to invalidate that information. You cannot just take their claims and turn them into your claims where you say your process is doing this thing. This can be used as the basis of a lawsuit. It can be used as an FTC claim for truth in advertising. And we already know in our industry, um, a customer brings their vehicle in for repairs, you're repairing the uh, left quarter panel, and suddenly they're complaining that their radio doesn't work and it's, it's the shop's responsibility. It's something that you did or that you broke when the shop had your vehicle under their possession. I can already see the claims from customers saying, I did not have COVID-19, I took my car to get fixed, and now I got COVID-19 and was hospitalized, and I thought I was safe because they told me they disinfected my vehicle, when in fact you cannot substantiate this claim. So when we talk with customers, it's very important that we use the phrase, we will clean your vehicle with a disinfectant, which is factually true and can be substantiated without saying we will disinfect your vehicle. Those are two different things. One can be proven and can be supported, one cannot. Taking it one step further, we have regulatory agencies that are now getting involved. OSHA from their national office announced that on-site inspections of businesses are resuming and they will respond to COVID-19 related complaints from employees, hospitalizations and fatalities. They are seeing COVID-19 as a health and safety issue and they've already communicated that it could be an OSHA recordable if there are clusters of cases at your facility and you are not responding or resolving these issues. California agencies have already inspected and begun issuing citations for shops related to COVID-19 that do not have a written communicable disease plan. They do not have training records of their employees about COVID-19. They do not have safe distancing business practices or mandatory cloth mask policies for visitors if it's consistent with the local health guidance. We have seen this in California. Typically what happens is it starts to spread to other parts of the country over the coming months, especially as we see secondary spikes in certain states. This is going to be the new normal, especially as states have continued to relax restrictions and reopen their economies. So it is important that shops have a game plan and have implemented procedures for COVID-19 and they do not become complacent. If you need assistance with OSHA, EPA, DOT compliance, or COVID-19, we are here to help. GMG and VirusSafe can become your compliance department that will protect your business, your employees, and your community.
We have a compliance dashboard for all of your shop's compliance needs, and we are providing in all markets currently on-site risk assessments and in-person safety training uh, across the country. With that, I will open it up for questions either on the uh, shop safety or COVID-19. Melissa, did we get any questions? We don't have any uh, yet, but um, I do follow up with everybody who was on the webinar, and I will send you Brandon's information. So if you do have questions, you can ask him directly. And we appreciate you guys uh, giving us your suggestions on future webinar, webinar ideas. That's how we come up with most of these. So we appreciate that and look for your future suggestions. Um, I don't see any uh, questions. So with that, uh, you were very thorough. Excellent job. Thanks, Brandon. Um, we're going to conclude the webinar and we'll be in touch with future training opportunities. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a good day.